All right, guys, we're only a couple days until the election. Election fever's in the air. We don't know who Chris is voting for yet. But, you know, some people are saying, and I don't know if this is true or not, Courtney, you and I were talking about this, but because yields are going up, Bitcoin's going up, that maybe the market's pricing in a Trump election victory. I don't know if that's true. I'm not sure I buy it, but what do you think? Yeah, and I think there is an argument to be made that that's happening. Um, a lot of analysts will point out to the fact that Bitcoin is doing really well because Trump has come out and he's been very pro-Bitcoin. So people are saying, oh, the reason that's going up is because the markets assume that Trump is going to win the election. But then on the flip side, like you and I were talking about, maybe this is just kind of a risk on where people are willing to take more risk in the markets right now and throwing more money at something like a Bitcoin, assuming that the economy is going to continue to do well. Well, you know, it's hard to predict. Uh, I mean, if you look at um, the last administration that uh, when Trump was president and everybody thought, wow, energy stocks are going to go through the roof. Well, the opposite happened, right? Energy had its worth four years, um, you know, than, than the previous four years. And then Joe Biden's administration comes in and it's like, oh, energy is really going to get punished now because he's so anti uh, energy and anti fracking. And energy had one of the best four years it's ever had. So, you know, even if you predict the outcome of an election, it doesn't mean that the uh, markets are going to see it the same way you do. And let's face it, guys, the market loves divided government. So it doesn't have confidence in anybody. And at this point, it's like a coin flip, like, all right, well, if there's a Democratic sweep, this will happen. If it's a Republican sweep, this will happen. <laughs> They're not even sure if there's going to be a sweep or who's going to win what. Uh, it's all going to come down to the day after. And I guarantee what's going to happen the day after, guys. We're all going to start worrying about the next election. You know what, Bob? You know, true words have been spoken. But I do think the bond market has already voted. Um, you know, we've seen Treasury yields go up a lot since, ironically, since the Fed started cutting rates in September up to like 4.3% on the 10-year Treasury and that says to me, whoever gets in office, deficit spending is going to continue because these politicians can't help themselves. So, you know, one thing we've talked about a lot on the show is just that I see more inflation in the future. That's what my, uh, my, that's what my crystal ball is telling me. Yeah, because I've been watching the campaign ads, right? I thought that the inflation was from corporate greed. <laughs> now, now you're talking about <laughs> government spending. When did that happen? <laughs> I missed those trillions upon trillions of dollars that the uh, Trump and Biden administration spent over the last couple of years to cause inflation. Um, but I think that's the, the bigger issue here. I don't know if the market's telling you it's going to be one candidate or the other, but I think it's pretty confident to say that there's no reeling in of uh, of government spending coming anytime soon. And I think this is just a reminder, like not to change your investments based on the election. And I'm hearing a lot of that right now where not necessarily people are investing one way or another, but nobody wants to make a decision on anything until after the election. This happens in the stock markets right now. People don't want to buy houses until after the election. Like everyone just saying, let's wait and see what's going to happen. But realistically, we're just at least going to know who's going to be in office. It doesn't matter who it is. But then we know what the next four years will be. And then all that certainty comes back in. So I don't think you should delay these conversations. It tends to be a good thing either way, just once we get past that date. Well, I don't know, Court. I just read that uh, Apple stopped making any iPhones until after the election. <laughs> NVIDIA is not selling any GPUs. Um, they're not pumping any gas at the uh, Phillips station right now because they got to wait until the election happens. I mean, it's... It's really kind of silly, right? You know, commerce continues no matter what's happening. And, and, you know, a lot of folks, well, I guess they just need another excuse to procrastinate. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I missed that news article when they said they're going to cut every dividend in our portfolio. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's a good point. It's like, you know, if you're like sitting in cash right now, you know, those yields, you know, they're not going to stay forever. Um, and if we're going to see inflation, I mean, the best possible place to overcome that's a stock market. No, that's a great point. If you sat in bonds, you sat in cash last couple of years, inflation ate your lunch. Let's be real about it. Um, but I think it also, you know, think about the all weather portfolio. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen. We can't anticipate because whatever we think may happen, depending on who gets in office, typically doesn't happen. So just by owning everything and being prepared, I think is always the best strategy. And that's why you don't want to sell in your laurels now, because once you have certainty, markets are already going to move and you're going to be like, man, I wish I had my money there. So have it there ahead of time um, and have it diversified ahead of time. And I think that's the mistake most investors make right now. Yeah. I mean, I get, I get the feeling, Ryan, you're going to sit on your laurels, you know, being 100% <laughs> NVIDIA when it's sitting at an all-time record high. I mean, you told us. <laughs> I'm the rich brother. We all know that. <laughs> well, you know, not to, not to, um, use the wrong adjective here, but you know what Trump's elections is a resilient economy. I mean, we've had an economy that has been going gangbusters in spite of, you know, higher interest rates, right? Jobless claims continue to drop. 
durable good orders were big uh, last week. And now GDP is expected, you know, to come in at three, three and a quarter percent. You know, over the last six quarters, we've had a GDP that's growing at three percent. So, you know, in stocks are slaves of earnings power, right? They, you know, they 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 need earnings go up, prices go up. That's what PE ratios are about. Uh, so I think at this point, you know, we've been in a big booming bull market. We just had a two year birthday of the of the bull market. Um, I think uh, anybody who's guessing it's over is is going to be a little bit premature. Yeah, and that's a great point too. Don't wait for the election because the fundamentals are just so good right now, right? Like you said, we're having economic growth accelerate, which is a positive. Uh, we're seeing wage growth go up over inflation now. Inflation in the short term is moderated, even though we may have longer term inflation. Uh, corporate profits, we know are accelerating into next year. This is kind of like, it doesn't really get better than this. Uh, in terms of economic conditions, even though it feels a little bit like with inflation being so high for people. Um, you know, besides that, like I can't think of a better scenario to get your money to work. Meanwhile, many of us still want to wait. Yeah, I'm actually looking for a guarantee, <laughs> right? I don't know. He keeps spelling out this economic nirvana. So uh, I hope he's right. But, you know, a lot of this is based on AI, right? AI is going to increase productivity across the board, uh, which we kind of believe that's that's what's going to happen. And, you know, which is great because, you know, it's not all about technology stocks now because every company is a technology company. And I think we're going to see enhancements in productivity. You now, we can't even imagine or fathom at this point. So it's, it's you know, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's good to be it's good to be in the, in the position to vote this week. Um, I hope your vote matters, but it's even a better position, you know, to be in the greatest country in the world where the GDP is climbing every single quarter. And the stock market's making new highs in spite of the valuations. Yeah. So, Bob, rumor has it you're going to vote early because you're an upstanding citizen. Well, you know, Ry, I've always been a trend follower and there's 46 million votes have been casted. I don't want to be left out. So um, as soon as I get off this podcast, I'm going online to find out where my local voting site is. Well, I guess the big the big question is, is not who's going to get elected. It's whether Ryan's going to vote or not. Oh, I'm voting this year for sure. I'm voting this year for sure. And the only thing I know is Bob Quinn's going to go higher after the election. That's my one prediction. You heard it here first. <laughs> well, you know, there are a few guarantees, uh, death, taxes, and Bob Quinn. <laughs> and Bob, we trust. <laughs> Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life, and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, since it's Halloween, uh, I thought we could be a little bit more on the festive side and we could talk about some of the scarier mistakes we see retirees and pre-retirees make with their money when it comes to financial planning. Yeah, I mean, you know, thinking about some of the scary things that I've seen in my career over the last 12, 13 years of, of uh, things that retirees have done um, to derail their financial plans. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is just simply spending too much money. And I think it's something you need to look at now, right? Because people might say, oh yeah, I can, I can afford to spend this money, but what you're spending now is gonna get bigger and bigger every year because of inflation. So you need to make sure that you can keep pace with that, not just now, but five years from now, 10 years from now, you need to start to plan for these things earlier. 
Yeah, it's almost as if it, it's it's not that people don't do any planning, is they do the wrong planning, right? They get the back of the envelope out and they calculate what their average return has been and then project that forward and they completely forget about inflation. Hidden insidious tax bobs, you like to call it. Um, and I think that's the one scary thing that we talk about a lot is not preparing enough for spending at least the same amount in retirement. Everybody thinks, well, I'm gonna front load my retirement, I'm gonna go on the vacations early on and I'm gonna have fun with the grandkids. And then later on, I'm gonna do nothing. But I always say like, we have a lot of clients in their 80s, almost 90, that still go on cruises or still living the good life. So you're spending the same as you did before, but on top of that, you have inflation. And I think that's what's not accounted for. And we talk about healthcare costs as well, um, a lot. And healthcare costs are another big item that we don't really plan for. Yeah, I was actually talking to a client of mine recently, Ren, you were there, um, and they were thinking about going into some kind of continuing care community. And uh, we found out that just to get in, it was gonna cost 300,000, plus the monthly fees were close to 5,000 a month. So you know, when you run that through the projections, fortunately we plan for it, you know, that can really spend down a portfolio very quickly if you haven't thought about it. Yeah, but a trend I'm seeing, and I think it's more dangerous than the person that's actually doing it, are people retiring way too early. Um, that's why we're keeping you working, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm carrying the flag and the banner for the baby boomers, you know, keep going, keep going, don't stop. <laughs> well, people are living so much longer, right? I think that's the thing is when you used to retire, at, you know, 55, 60 was like a standard retirement, but people weren't living as long. So now you're planning for like a 30 year retirement, which is just as long as you were working. I mean, that's why you really need to make sure that you have enough assets in order to last you. Yeah, you do. And I think what's actually scary as well is we find that a lot of people that are actually set, let's say you have saved enough, you're retired now, you're retired at the appropriate time. And I think this is one of the bigger issues we're, we're seeing a lot with our client base and talking to potential clients is taking way too much risk. All of a sudden you're in your 60s or your 70s and your portfolio, because the market's gone up so much, is like something like 70% stocks or 80% stocks. And we know in a down market, that ain't pretty. Yeah, especially when you consider that people need to withdraw that money every month. I mean, we've talked about this in the past that you know you don't wanna take money out of your portfolio when it's down 40%. You, know, you need to have that level, stable income plan. Chris, I don't think, Microsoft, Nvidia, Apple, and Bitcoin could ever go down that much. Well, you know, right? To use a to use a, a, a term that Dad likes to say. Well, what's the next one? <laughs> yeah, but you know, guys, I've been through a couple of cycles, and you know, you went through the real estate cycle uh, twenty years ago, where you know people were paying up for real estate at any price, and the mantra among the realtors, the appraisers, the investors, the speculators, the flippers, whatever you want to call them was, you know, real estate never really goes down, you know, goes up in price and then it goes sideways and plateaus and builds a foundation and then it goes to a higher high. Well, I'm, I'm hearing the same arguments now about the stock market. And, you know, I got to tell you, there's a 50, 60 percent decline coming. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know why. That's why you diversify, guys. Exactly. If we did, Bob, we know you'd be on your yacht. Um, and, and that's such a great point, right? And I think right now, and I've seen this a lot, just talking to, to different clients, like, you know what, the market's hot right now. Why don't we take some of that safe bond money and why don't we reinvest it back in the stock market while the getting's good? First off, when risk assets are up, that's when you have the most risk. And you know, the one thing I said to this specific client was, you don't make all your money in bull markets, you make them by not losing in bear markets. So it's not about getting all the upside right now. And I think that's the wrong strategy. It's like, at some point when the shoe does drop, how well you protect it. And we know you gotta be protected ahead of time. You know, you, you can't anticipate these things. Um, and again, my crystal ball doesn't work either, Bob, unfortunately. Well, right, I don't like you using my question on the podcast. You know, like, uh, why, why, why aren't you taking that money out of my bonds and buying me more uh, tech stocks, right? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, keep, those quest, keep those questions I ask you, uh, you know, confidential, please. But, you know, Here's the other thing. Why are people so negative overall, right? That, you know, the consumer sentiment is running at numbers like we usually have in recessions. Um, you know, things aren't awful. There's a reason why the stock market and valuations are at an all-time record high. Well, I think the problem is, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, is inflation, obviously, when you look at wages versus inflation, you look at uh, food inflation, you look at energy inflation, they've been higher than what wages have gone up by. And that's like two of the most important uh, you know, needs for the American consumer. And that's why people maybe don't feel great, even though the economy looks good on paper. You know, another mistake I see, guys, that uh, people make in their planning 
is they give too much away, right? They give too much away before they're in the retirement years. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, setting up trust for your children or giving it to your favorite charity. Um, these are, there's always time for that. But I find uh, that, you know, when it really gets tight, you know, when folks get into their late 70s, early 80s, is suddenly they gave away too much. Right. I don't, I don't recall receiving any kind of, uh, you know, gifting or, or early <laughs> inheritance. I don't know. I mean, is that, is that really true? What scares me is Bob's not giving away enough. Um, but you guys have to talk to Allie and, uh, actually she's under a, um, <laughs> she's under a gag order. So you're not allowed to know. <laughs> no, but that is a really good point is you got to make sure you're covered first and you're right. Aggressive gifting, um, especially earlier on in retirement can be a big, big problem. Um, that's why you need to run those numbers every single year. You have to know like, okay, what did I spend this year? How did my portfolio do? What's inflation look like and reevaluate. Am I spending too much or, or can I afford to gift? And I think we don't run that exercise often enough. Yeah, I have a, a client that's uh, that's it's, it's relatively young, and um, he had asked me recently if he could give a hundred thousand uh, to his son to buy a house, and I said sure. I said, but you, you can only live to seventy five. <laughs> <laughs> that's a no. <laughs> yeah, and once you are at RMD age, meaning you have to take money out of your IRAs, you can actually use that for charitable contributions. So if you're giving money to your church regularly or your charities regularly, you can actually save on taxes by taking it out of your IRA. And I have seen people go to the extreme where they say, well, I don't want to pay anything to the government, so I'm going to give as much as possible to charity. And just keep in mind, only a portion of that's going for taxes. So I have some people who actually give up extra more than they would normally contribute just to save on a portion of taxes. But you need to make sure you're, you're figuring out what do I need later in life. Yeah, that's a really good point, Courtney. And actually, uh, you know, on, on Bob's topic of giving money away, you know, that includes the IRS, too. You know, those years that, uh, you know, you, you, you should maybe start to level out some of those IRAs, maybe take those distributions a little sooner, do some of those Roth conversions can save you an enormous amount of money in taxes. Oh, yeah. You know, there's there's lots of mistakes. I mean, obviously, overspending, gifting too early, um, you know, not investing properly, you know. And I think the biggest problem, I mean, the biggest mistake every single person can make is not recognizing you don't know what you don't know. And that's why you need to hire a firm that has certified financial planners. Without a CFP running your financial plan, I got to say, you're going to leave a ton on the table and you just might not get there. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, as of the second quarter of 2024, the total net worth of U.S. households and nonprofit organizations reached a record $150 trillion and yes, this is netted out for debts. We've gained $100 trillion over the past 15 years. That's a much wealthier America. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a huge number. And the thing that's amazing, you netted it out for debt, but relative to the amount of assets that have been created, the amount of debt hasn't kept up with it. So actually debt service, what it costs the average individual to support that debt is one of the lowest in history. So it's... Um, Looking good for people who want to leverage their balance sheet. Looks like a lot of opportunity, right? Spoken like a true baby boomer. <laughs> How can I leverage <laughs> my balance sheet? But no, I mean, it's, it's a good point. You always hear about these trillion dollars in credit card debt and some of these like more shocking statistics, but they never put it into you know relative terms of how much more wealthy the U.S. Uh, household is today. It's pretty remarkable. All right, Chris, get excited. At market close on October 14th, the FT Wilshire 5000 total market index reached its highest market value ever at $56.37 trillion, while the number of stocks in the Wilshire was down to only 3,328 stocks. That's the lowest number of stocks in the index since it was created in 1974. In the 90s, you had something like 4,000 plus IPOs, but the numbers have gone down sharply over the last couple of decades. Only 1,200 IPOs in, from 2000 to 2009, and we've only had like 1,100 from 2010 to 2019, a lot more companies are staying private, not going public anymore. Yeah, well, you know what I gleaned from that stat is like, you know, less and less, and less companies are becoming public companies are staying private, but who knows, maybe in uh, 20 years, we might see paying capital on the public markets. Oh yeah, that's your uh, prediction? We'll see. I'm, I'm hoping to be retired by then, Chris, so <laughs> you guys can carry the torch. Wait, you're not retired today? <laughs> <laughs> One would think, one would think. Uh, who will retire first, me or Bob? That's the real question. <laughs> All right, Courtney, 
an estimated 70% of people turning 65 will need long-term care. Seven in 10 of the 11,200 baby boomers who reach that age every single day, that's a wild stat, from help, need help at home with daily tasks to full servicing nursing. Yeah, and I think this is something that's good to know as a retiree, that this is one of your biggest costs to plan for in retirement. And we do this for people all the time where you want to see, okay, what are those costs going to be? And can I fund it with the assets I have? If not, should you look to insure it? It is not a cheap insurance. Um, so it's just good to you know run those in your numbers so you know what you're looking at. And it's wild too. I mean, you see all the premium hikes that these insurance companies are trying to pull because they mispriced it initially. Some people were seeing like 150% premium hikes. It's crazy, uh, which you really do have to do the run the numbers on this. Uh, and a lot of cases self-insure. Yeah. But man, oh man, like if you're not running that in your wealth projections, that's a big problem. Yeah, it's a good thing people are living a lot longer, but also that means the insurance companies have to pay out more. So they're increasing the prices on everyone. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 181, Pain Points of Wealth. If you love our podcast, we hope you love it. We know you love our podcast. Uh, you can give us a five-star rating on iTunes, Spotify. You can subscribe to our channel. And if this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. Do you update every week of all our new content? Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.